In this video, we'll talk about Bacillus anthracis. Now, if you've been following along and going in order, we've just completed all of the Clostridium subspecies shown in red. And so this video, again, if you're going in order, will mark the first video where we enter that center blue category that says Bacillus. And we'll begin, of course, with this video, Bacillus anthracis. So this is a gram-positive rod. It is spore-forming, it is non-motile, and it's zoonotic, which, as the name implies, means that this bacteria affects animals, namely farm animals like cows, sheep, goat, etc. Now, a little aside here, a little historical note, the, the disease that Bacillus anthracis causes is called anthrax, right? That term refers to the clinical manifestation of this bacteria. And anthrax used to be called wool sorters disease because if you had an occupational exposure where you were working with farm animals and uh, taking their hide or their wool off their body and the bacteria was in the wool, you were more likely to get anthrax. And specifically, you were more likely to get pulmonary or respiratory anthrax. More on that later. So there's an occupational exposure where if you're taking your USMLE or your COMLEX or whatever in-class exam you're taking and you see that somebody works with farm animals or sorts wool or works with the hide of animals, that's an occupational risk for getting anthrax. So keep that in mind. Now that's the animal infection, but human infection usually occurs via inhalation of the bacterial spores. There are different types of anthrax disease. There are four types to be exact, and I'll get into each of those four types individually later on in this video. Now, historically, Bacillus anthracis was associated with bioterrorism. And the concern here was that some entity, for example, a government, might use aerosolized anthrax and package it and send it out to infect the widespread public. Um, so this bacteria, for that reason, tends to be a bit better known than other bacteria. Now here's what the bacteria looks like. I don't have an image of it, but for completeness sake, I do want you to know that if you see something that looks like Medusa head, or you see a buzzword that says Medusa head, that's telling you that the answer is Bacillus anthracis. So again, brief aside here, the mythological creature Medusa has snakes for hair, and it is said that if she stares at you, she turns you to stone and kills you instantly. But the big thing here is that she has snakes for hair, and so if you don't know what the mythological creature Medusa looks like, Google her now. But you're probably sitting there wondering, well, how does this relate to Bacillus anthracis? Well, if you see the buzzword Medusa, or more high yield, if you see the buzzword Halo of Projections, that's telling you that the answer is Bacillus anthracis. The way that this bacteria looks on the blood agar plate is that it has a, quote, halo of projections, end quote, which is said to look like the head of Medusa because, again, the mythological creature Medusa had snakes for hair, and so she had all of these projecting, sort of linear, um, torturous, snake-looking things. Uh, so if you Google Bacillus anthracis Medusa or Bacillus anthracis, halo of projections, you can see pretty quickly that the plate that you're looking at looks as if it's Medusa's head on the plate, but that's really a unique feature of Bacillus anthracis, so keep that in mind. It's pretty high yield. Let's talk about the virulence factors. There's only two that you need to know, and they're both really high yield because they show up on exams a lot. So this is actually an area that I think is easy to memorize, but even though it's easy to memorize, you get a lot of points out of this material, so know this well. The first virulence factor is a polypeptide capsule, and that capsule is made of D-glutamate. Now this is extremely unique to Bacillus anthracis. There's no other bacteria that has this type of capsule. And this capsule inhibits the lysis step of phagocytosis. So recall that toward the end of phagocytosis, to completely remove a foreign pathogen, you have to use lysis. But the D-glutamate capsule that sits on the bacillus anthracis prevents that final lysis step of phagocytosis. So in other words, any bacillus anthracis that's encapsulated is pretty much immune to phagocytosis. And you can see pretty quickly that this is a huge virulence factor. The really high yield virulence factor though is the AB toxin. 
And the AB toxin gets confused by medical students all the time, so let me just take a moment to oversimplify this and explain it to you like you're a fifth grader. So the AB toxin is a three-component toxin. Now to be clear, this isn't the only bacteria with an AB toxin, there are others. But Bacillus anthracis is the only bacteria where the AB toxin is three components. Now the two components of it are the AB subunit and the B subunit. And within that A subunit, there are two elements. And in that B subunit, there is one element. So collectively, three different components or three different elements that confer the virulence of the AB toxin. Now, to be perfectly clear, it's the AB toxin that is responsible for all of the clinical features of the anthrax disease. And that A subunit has two virulence parts and that B subunit has one virulence part. And I'm gonna explain them to you now, but I'll color code them so you can clearly see which components correspond to the A subunit and which components correspond to that B subunit. Now within the A subunit, we have edema factor and we have lethal factor. Edema factor mimics adenylate cyclase, which causes edema, right? Hence the name edema factor. And lethal factor is a metalloprotease that cleaves something called MAPKK, which causes immediate cell death, hence the name lethal factor. It's very lethal because it cleaves, it kills, it causes cell death. Now that's both of the components of the A subunit, but I told you that the B subunit also has a component. The B subunit gives rise to something called protective antigen. And what that does is it binds to endothelial cells. And when it does that, it basically lets the A subunit come into the host cell. So that B subunit with its protective antigen binding to endothelial cells has an accessory role that basically unlocks the key that lets the A subunit in. And then once the A subunit is in the host cell, Edema factor causes cellular swelling, known as edema, and then lethal factor cleaves something, killing the cell. And it's that edema and killing that pretty much confers all of the clinical manifestations that you're familiar with when you think of anthrax disease. Now, I have a mnemonic to remember all of this information. And the mnemonic is really helpful because not only does it tell you which factor or which component belongs to which subunit, but it also reminds you what the subunit or what the factor is actually doing in terms of pathophysiology. So my mnemonic is on the slide now. What I want you to memorize is edemolate cyclase, lethal cleaver, and endobelial cells. The first thing that you'll notice is that within each of these words, you either see the A for A subunit or the B for B subunit. So you know which element comes from which subunit of the AB toxin. But the more important part of this mnemonic is that it tells you the pathophysiology of each of these factors. For example, instead of saying edema factor, we say edemolate cyclase, which reminds you that edema factor mimics adenylate cyclase. And for lethal cleaver, that reminds you that lethal factor cleaves MAPKK because it's a lethal cleaver. Endobelial cells reminds you that the B subunit has this thing that binds to endothelial cells. So with all three of these components, you know the pathophysiology. So the mnemonic is beautiful. Let's move on and talk about clinical features. So really the only thing you need to know with the clinical features of Bacillus anthracis are the four different types of anthrax that it causes. So let's begin with the most common type, and that's cutaneous anthrax. If you're taking an exam, this is probably the one that's going to show up. So cutaneous anthrax, as the name implies, it's cutaneous, so you see it on the skin. It begins as a painless papule with vesicles, and the painless papule with vesicles will progress to the classic ulcer with a black eschar. And what that's telling you, and you can see it in this picture, is that there's significant cell necrosis going on. Again, remember the AB toxin. That lethal factor cleaves MAPKK and causes cell death. So it's not surprising that we see a very significant and a very prominent cellular necrosis. So that's cutaneous anthrax. And what you wanna be on the lookout for is the image that you see on this slide. Next, we have respiratory, also known as pulmonary anthrax. 
And this begins with a flu-like symptoms, and then you get mediastinitis. So literally, the mediastinum becomes inflamed. You can also see hemorrhage, and this can progress pretty quickly into septic shock. Now, the image on the slide that you see here is what's known as widening of the mediastinum. And you can see that that mediastinal area is just more widened, right? It's stretched out laterally. And this is something that you want to be on the lookout for on your exam. If they give you this image, they're trying to tell you that not only is it respiratory slash pulmonary anthrax, but of course it's bacillus anthracis. The third type of anthrax is GI anthrax. And this one is pretty simple. It's just nausea, vomiting, bloody diarrhea, and lymph adenitis. So anything that sounds gastrointestinal, as the name implies, it could be gastrointestinal anthrax. Now, most medical students stop here and they say, okay, these are the three types of anthrax disease that comes from bacillus anthracis. But truly, there's a fourth one. And, the, and this fourth one is relatively new. It wasn't discovered all too long ago, and for that reason, it has the potential to become more high yield on exams. Anything that medical students don't classically associate with some element of USMLE or COMLEX is likely to be tested because as we discover more about new diseases that go back many years, those new elements will show up on your test because they become public health concerns. So the fourth type of anthrax is what's known as injection anthrax. And this is very similar to cutaneous anthrax in terms of the symptoms that it causes. But the association that you want to know is that it's associated with heroin contamination. So sometimes when heroin gets produced, it can be diluted with contaminants. And if those contaminants have any exposure to the bacteria bacillus anthracis, then either the bacteria or the spores can get into the heroin and contaminate it. And so basically, if someone were using heroin, you know, via intravenous drug abuse, they would be injecting anthrax directly into their skin. And so the hallmark of this type of anthrax is that it infects the deep layers of the skin and muscle in the local area in which it was injected. And once it's inside, it spreads very, very quickly. So this is important not only, like I said before, because it could be a public health concern as we deal with the opioid epidemic, but also this disease is classically associated with other occupational exposures, hence the name wool sorters disease. So in the past, if you were taking your exam, you would be on the lookout for somebody that works with farm animals and sorts wool, and that would be the, the sort of association or connection in your brain. But as this becomes more well known, I do want you to think about someone who is an intravenous drug abuser because you do want to associate this type of anthrax with heroin contamination. So that's very, very high yield. Let's wrap up by talking about treatment. Now, truly treatment is really beyond the scope of step one and level one, but just to simplify things, if it's non-systemic anthrax, you give either a fluoroquinolone or doxycycline. If it is systemic, you give the same thing that I just said, but you also add combination therapy with either linazolid or clindamycin. And lastly, regardless of the type of anthrax, every patient could technically be given antitoxin or monoclonal antibodies. And for those monoclonal antibodies, you would either give raxibacumab or oblituximab. And I butchered the name, I'm sure, but that's what you want to remember. Here's the summary slide. So again, we're talking about a rod-shaped gram-positive organism. It's spore-forming. The two major virulence factors is one, the D-glutamate capsule that blocks the lysis step of phagocytosis, and then two, the three-component AB toxin, which has an A subunit with edema factor and lethal factor and a B subunit with protective antigen. Remember that edema factor mimics adenylate cyclase, so we call it edemylate cyclase, and lethal factor cleaves MAPKK, so we call it the lethal cleaver. Lastly, remember that the B subunit binds to endothelial cells, and we remember that with endobelial cells. For treatment, we've got fluoroquinolone, plus or minus doxycycline, plus or minus antitoxin and monoclonal antibodies. Remember also that you can do combination therapy, so you can also add in linazolid or clindamycin. Four types of anthrax not shown on this slide. Know the four different types, and remember that injection anthrax is associated with heroin use. That's all. Good luck.